I'm here with Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. I'm so excited, Anthony. You're um, you're a longevity doctor. You have such a great background, and you are a picture of health, which is always the main thing, right? I, I don't want a doctor who doesn't look healthy. So you look you look incredible. Thanks, man. Right back at you. So, uh, Anthony, can we talk a little bit about your background because it's such a powerful story? And I was going to say it in the intro, and then I'd much rather it comes from you because it really explains your mission and why you're so passionate about you know what you do. Sure. Well. I run two companies. One is called Fit Father Project and the other one's Fit Mother Project. And the mission of those two companies is to help busy moms and dads, particularly over 40 in the midpoint of life when we're trying to juggle our families, our work responsibilities, and our health. I help people design sustainable routines, lose the weight, basically get on a health routine for themselves and their families. And the reason that I got passionate about this work was Not that I wanted to be a doctor growing up. I just unfortunately saw my own dad work himself to the bone, put his health on the back burner because he was so focused on basically busting his butt with long nights of work to put food on the table for me, my mom, my little brother. In the process, his health routines got put on the back burner and he eventually got sick and he died when he was just 42 years old. And I was nine years old at the time. And to witness the effects of seeing my dad he was my superhero, you know, the man I looked up to so much. And I saw his health just slowly decline. And then all of a sudden, you know, at the end of his life, he was confined in his bed dying. And he a cancer diagnosis and, and ultimately is what took his life. And I saw him go through chemo, radiation, multiple surgeries. And what it really impacted me at a young age seeing that is I learned that health is the foundation of everything we love as parents. Health gives us our ability to show up for our lives and for our families and to be around. And I saw that my dad just didn't have the right mindset and priorities around this stuff. And it ultimately cost him everything that he did love in life. And I guess the silver lining was, as I was starting to heal and process this pain, um, I started to invest in my health and fitness. And I found that as I started to get stronger and I started to eat better and started to exercise because I wanted to be there to help my mom, my little brother, and I was quote unquote, the man of the house at roughly 10 years old, that I started to feel better. I started to feel a little more in control of my life at that time. And I started to feel happier. And that snowballed into a massive passion that effectively brought me into a phase of my life that I consider my fitness and personal training phase, which was basically trying to get as fit as possible. And like you, I had competitive athletic aspirations. You know, you got into MMA and fighting. I got into competitive bodybuilding. And it was a really cool experience to be able to take my body to a a very high level through very dedicated training. And then ultimately, when I got into naturopathic medical school, I just saw so many people like my dad, they didn't always have cancer. Maybe it was pre-diabetes, blood pressure, dysregulation, depression. But all of this is because people weren't managing these foundational health routines because of the common excuses. I'm getting older, this or that hurts, I'm too busy, I can't find time to fit all this into my schedule. And so I knew that there needed to be a solution, especially when you look at the statistics and like over 40, people are like, half of people are overweight, obese. It's estimated the cancer rates are gonna double in the next few years. It's like the trajectory is not good. There's a lot of stuff going on. But clearly, there are people that know how to turn things around. Clearly, there are people who are living into their 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond who have great health, great families, and these integrated lives. And I wanted to help people solve that. So I started the Fit Father Project kind of in memory of my dad. And this was around 10 years ago. And since that time, we've had over 50,000 dads in over 100 countries go through our programs and get their health right. And it's been amazing to witness the transformations that can happen when guys get a sustainable routine that's age appropriate. And then we started Fit Mother Project because a lot of the guys were like, hey, I have my wife, my sister, my spouse, you know, I, and we need help too. And so Fit Mother has been around and around 10,000 ladies have gone through that. So I'm grateful to be here on this podcast because you're clearly a man that is just so integrated and focused on leadership, entrepreneurship, fatherhood. And, you know, now being over 40, I know that there's a different gravity to your health decisions that is a little different than maybe when you were trying to push your athletic performance. So I'm excited to dive into all these topics and be of as much service in this time as I can be. Oh, brother, I'm so I'm so happy to hear that. And I'm so excited too, because you're such a kind of spirit. I am literally the perfect, I'm in the demographic, right? I'm 44, I'm a new dad, and I'm trying to juggle um, I think my physical peak was probably 35. That was my last professional MMA fight. Mm-hmm. And then I still um, was competing in other things after that. But I felt like it was a, after that, I was at the stage of my life where I was like, okay, it's time to get serious. I kind of let my finances go in disarray. And I've got to, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not a kid anymore. It's time to be a bit more responsible. Then I met my wife and I and I got married and we had a son. And now I'm at the stage where 
think I can speak for a lot of people listening to this in their forties. The biggest, um, the biggest problem I have is is energy and time. It's always those yeah. two things. You're trying to juggle those things, and I see these young athletic superstars at the gym, these twenty two year olds, twenty three year olds, and I'm like, I. I love their dedication, but I'm always like, they have no clue how how much harder it is as you get older. You know, it really, really is. Your 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 responsibilities. I feel like every year yes. you get older, especially if you have a family. The responsibilities just keep adding and adding and adding. And the easiest thing to go is your workouts. And um, the w- one thing I've come to realize is, if I go to bed at the end of a long day and I got some type of exercise in, even if the rest of my day was incredibly unproductive, I'm happy. Whereas if yeah. I worked and I, I was really productive work-wise all day, but I didn't get a work at in, I kind of feel a, bit, a little bit upset. So I'm glad that I have the right priority. But even so, even me, someone that's that's lived his whole life trying to prioritize that, I find it so difficult now. So I can only imagine you know, people that have two, three kids, they don't have an athletic right. background. I can only imagine how hard it is. Um, is is there some certain things, Anzi, that you um, kind of like the, like if we look at a pyramid, so the things yep. that are almost the easiest to do with the highest return, I'm assuming, because like, there's so many yes. different things. And, and I love to touch on a, a bunch of these different things, but in terms of the, the the basics or the bottom of the pyramid, what are some things that you like to start with when you talk to people? Well, I, I think even just how you frame that question is like, is really revealing. It's like, as busy parents, we're looking for the high leverage activities, the stuff that we can focus on that gives us a big return for our buck. And I want to get into those. And I actually think in terms of this pyramid hierarchy as well. But I think it's important to like take an even bigger picture philosophy first about the fact that the quality of our lives, and this is something that my dad learned firsthand on the negative side of things, is ultimately determined by the energy, the vibrancy, and the health of our bodies. And as we get older, the stakes get even higher. Like there's a lot of wiggle room in your 20s and maybe your 30s where you can get away with certain kinds of things and you have a certain amount of resilience. But the stuff you start to do in your 40s is what's going to show up in your 50s and your 60s. It's the stuff that shows up as the heart disease, the chronic disease, the cancer risk. So like there's weight to our decisions. We're oftentimes when we're in stress and pressure of our busy lives, we're thinking in terms of short-term lenses. We're thinking about getting through the day. We're thinking about coping with stress with foods or whether or not we can fit something in. Whereas the real long-term perspective that we must take puts a little more weight into our actions. And the cool thing is when you're on this health and fitness routine and we're gonna follow this pyramid that we're gonna build out in just a moment, Um, effectively, this gives us energy. Like I think there's times and things that take away energy, like sort of, for example, a high intensity workout that is energy invested. And you invest like five or 10 units of energy on a given day. And over the course of a month, that's actually going to give you more energy, but this is an energy investment, but there's certain stuff that you do every single day, like your nutrition, which I would put at the bottom of the pyramid, along with mindset that is foundational that you're going to do regardless of, and it doesn't require energy. So let's just say you're going to eat two, three meals a day. Whether or not those meals are healthy or whether those meals are unhealthy is going to determine your blood sugar stability, how much energy you have. And I think when it comes to, we'll get into nutrition in just a moment, but I I want to kind of get into the, the mindset aspect a little bit, because I think people who are struggling with health routines and don't have things nailed right now are thinking in a logical fallacy. And that's that they believe that their life is like, if you've ever seen those two Venn di- the Venn diagram, we have one circle over here and another circle over here. People yes. that struggle with their health believe that their health and the rest of their lives are two separate circles. Mm-hmm. They believe that you have business, family, responsibilities in one circle, and the health and something like that is something that you'll find time to get to. And my main fundamental premise before we get into like the strategies and the tactics is you must collapse down that circle and just see your life as one integrated thing if you are to succeed. If you continue to compartmentalize your health as something separate from the rest of the flow of your life, then you can say, I don't have time for X, Y, Z, because you think it's something different. And what you said was very telling is almost like when you look at a day, there are certain boxes that you feel like you need to check and some kind of physical movement or activity is just something that almost makes a day feel like it's complete. So there's a completeness to it. And what that means to me is that in your mind, your mindset says that your day and your movement are like one integrated thing. And to have a productive day, means to have checked a movement box. So we got to collapse down these logical fallacies. And one of the ways we do that is we need to retrain our brain and our neuro associations that we create. So it's foundational for someone right now who's not consistent or wants to be better with their health to really make a stronger connection to why health connects to all of their core values. Why is health impacting your ability to be a great parent? How are your decisions with your health impacting your ability to make money? How is it affecting your spiritual alignment? How is it affecting your self-confidence? How is it affecting how much time that you do have? 
And I'll tell you this, just imagine if we could eat better or get in the right routines, it would reasonably give you one to two hours of productive energy back per day. If you weren't as groggy after meals, if you weren't as addicted to the phone because you had better neurotransmitter regulation, I mean, let's just say it's even one hour back. And during a work week, that's five hours back. So I, I guess I'm trying to say is that good health routines and good biochemical maintenance can actually give you time back over the long haul. But in the short term, it seems like if it's something separate, it takes away time. So the mindset is incredibly important to nail. And that's why, because before any of our members start a meal plan at our workouts, we go through this deep reflection process. So that's number one. And number two of the foundation of this pyramid, the secondary thing is nutrition. Because look, you may never exercise, but you are going to eat every day. And you can either eat foods that are giving you energy, stabilizing your blood sugar, keeping you full, not causing a lot of digestive stress, or you could be eating stuff that really is just like coping, you know, causing your blood sugar to go all crazy all over the place and creating negative momentum that you must reap later. We all have the experience where we ate the wrong things for breakfast before. Bagel and cream cheese, sugary juices, something like pancakes. And then we feel like crap the next few hours. And then we feel like exhausted. We need to have more coffee. And like the cycle kind of repeats itself. And that bleeds over into the next day. Like how much is that taking away from us by, by being caught in these cycles? So the way we break these cycles, I and I, I have a very specific process for us, is we focus on winning every single day. And the way we win a single day is starts with the beginning of the day. And so when we wake up, one of the first things I help our members do is we get a rehydration ritual in place. So first, one, one, 30, first 10 minutes that you wake up, I want people to drink 20 to 32 ounces of water. And if you throw minerals in your water, so like some pink Himalayan sea salt, you know, Celtic sea salt, or maybe some trace mineral drops, you're giving your body exactly what it needs for fantastic energy in the morning. And it's a little bit of a habit trick too, because every day, no matter what happened yesterday, maybe you ate the wrong things for dinner, you had a few drinks, whatever, you're resetting every fresh new day because we're always constantly with our health shifting and creating momentum. We've all had the experience where we have positive momentum in a good direction and that begets more good decisions. We've all had the experience where we have negative momentum and oftentimes we wanna make sure that doesn't go out into some huge tailspin where we go off the rails for weeks or months and get into this guilt cycle. So simple as the morning hydration has a physiologic basis, but also it has a psychological and behavioral basis. Now, the first meal of the day, I think is key. Whether you intermittent fast and that comes later in the day or you're a breakfast person, Everyone listening to this needs to standardize their first meal of the day. Like make it a go-to meal, one or two options. And ideally it's something that's really rich in micronutrients, vitamins, minerals. It has good protein and healthy fats. And I'll give some specific examples. But when it comes to our nutrition, we're balancing these two forces. We're balancing the force of consistency, which enables us to stay on track, and variety, which makes things fun. They need to be in rhythm. Too much consistency with no variety feels like it's restrictive. We're going to fall off track eventually. Too much variety, and we have to make decisions. It's like there's decision fatigue involved, and there's not enough structure. So I am a huge proponent of everyone, especially those interested in high performance, of having a standardized meal number one. What that often looks like for me is some kind of power protein shake. So this can be some kind of any kind of protein powder you love. You can throw in some super greens, some berries, maybe be some hemp seeds, chia seeds, like whatever. You're blending this thing up. It's very low digestive stress because you don't have to break down a smoothie. It's kind of like almost pre-digested, which means your energy is going to stay very high. It's not very taxing on your GI system. And it gives you a lot of good things. So just imagine this. If we're eating three meals per day, someone may not, but just go with me for seven days a week, that's 21 decision points. And just by removing one of those, by getting a standardized first meal of the day, that's one third of your rest of your life. Just think about how, how much weight there is to the foods that you put into your body. And if you can standardize just the first part of that, you're, you've won one third of the battle and you're starting every day with something that makes you feel great. Other things that are good is eggs. Eggs are fantastic breakfast foods. They actually are beneficial for your cholesterol, high in proteins and healthy fats. You can have fruits and other things like in the morning or some meats, et cetera. And we can get as specific into the foods as you'd like. But I think the overarching theme here is like, everyone needs to have a really good morning start point. And I'll make an assumption here, Lawrence, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you have a dialed in breakfast where you eat pretty much similar things on a regular basis. Is this true? Anthony, it's so funny when you were describing what you put in your shake, it's pretty much all the same ingredients. I do the same thing. Um, I did want to ask you, so I used to, um, cause you came from bodybuilding mm -hmm. when, growing up as a kid, I always, I always thought athletes need to eat, you know, five to seven meals a day because you're trying to absorb as many nutrients. 
And then this whole intermittent fasting thing became very uh, um, in vogue. So what I would normally do is I would get up, I would do exactly what you say. I would have a, a whole bunch of water and then I would have some some coffee. I would work for a few hours. I'd normally go to the gym around noon and then I would have my first meal would be a big shake that I would make and I would bring yep. to the gym. Recently, I've kind of done it the other way around where I wake up, I have some water, just like you said. I, I just got a cold plunge the last two weeks and I love that. Yes. A couple of minutes in there for, you know, to wake me up and then I, I'll... I make a big shake and I normally have half of it, you know, maybe an hour after waking up. And then I still try and get like a mid midday workout and then have the rest mm -hmm. after. So all the stuff you said was incredible. And so I love the fact that you know, talk about consistency. You talked about uh, decision fatigue. You talked about, um, you know, hydration first in the morning. Um, I'm glad to say that you and I have similar morning routines. Yes. But can you, can you talk a little bit about intermittent fasting? Because all the stuff I've read, I, I listened to a few audiobooks, I read a few books, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts. Everyone would talk about this thing where if you if you intermittent did intermittent fasting, suddenly you'd notice, you know, a decrease in body fat and increase in lean muscle. I did it for over about a year and a half. I didn't notice my my body composition has been very similar for years. You know, I'm very routine oriented. I work out every day. I, there's not much I'm changing in my routine. Um, so just changing from normal eating a lot, a lot to intermittent fasting, shortening my feeding window. I didn't notice a huge difference. It, and and I know coming from bodybuilding, I'd love to hear a bit about your thoughts where I try and do where I'm not eating the last few hours of, of before I go to mm -hmm. bed. Um, and then, but I'm waking up and I feel like my body is craving nutrients. I get that. And, yeah. and I'm very in tune with my body. And I don't know if it's because I, you know, worked out hard the day before and I'm in my forties and my body needs nutrients or, or what it is. But I noticed since I went back to having that shake earlier during the day, um, or at least half of it, um, I felt better. So I'd love to yeah. know a bit of your thoughts on intermittent fasting. For sure. Well, let's start big picture, then I'll comment on some of your specifics. Thank Our you. bodies need a balance between anabolic and catabolic metabolism. Anabolic metabolism is when we're feeding nutrients, particularly amino acids from the proteins, as well as carbohydrates. Insulin gets stimulated, which helps tissues store nutrients that come in, as well as grow. So like a bodybuilder is trying to maximize anabolism. That's why they're eating all the time. They're stimulating insulin. And in fact, the highest level bodybuilders often even take insulin uh, externally as a drug to help drive more nutrients into cells. And insulin is good for building things up. But the problem is it also leads to a, many of these pathways that can promote cancer and other things like this down the road. Now we have catabolic metabolism, which is a breaking down process. So fat loss by its very nature is catabolic. The fat cells are breaking down. Fasting by its very nature is catabolic. And what we know is when the body gets into a period of catabolic metabolism, a lot of phenomenal health changes happen. We get the chance to effectively digest any denatured proteins and clear out old cells that are not working well. Turns out that this doesn't happen in the presence of like anabolic metabolism with lots of insulin. So there's health benefits to fasting. It's called autophagy, which is the breakdown of those old cells. The brain releases something called BDNF, which increases new neurons and new connections. Growth hormone levels rise, which helps regenerate our tissues. All this stuff happens during fasting metabolism. So there's certainly benefit to it. Now, there's many ways to incorporate intermittent fasting, and quite frankly, just the process of having a slightly earlier dinner and then having a few hours before you go to bed where you're not eating and you're allowing the GI tract to rest, which promotes better sleep, in my opinion, is a form of intermittent fasting. I think let's just say you had dinner at six o'clock or 18, if you will, if you're on the 24 hour thing. And then, you know, and then you did, you ate again the next day at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., even with half of your shake. You've still been in a fasted state for about 12 of those hours, which is giving you some benefit. Now, that's like right. the daily concept, and I don't think everyone needs to daily intermittent fast. In fact, based on your body fat level, which when you get lower, it tends to be where people do want food a little earlier in the day, based on your exercise demands or what you just find works for you, it's not necessarily to fast every single day with an intermittent fasting time-restricted window, although I do think it's beneficial for almost everyone not to have big meals late at night because it doesn't attune to our natural circadian rhythm. We do better and the GI tract is most active during the time when the sun is up. And this is the new frontier of health that everyone's going to start talking about more is in training our training and training our nutrition to the light cycles, which is effectively what a circadian rhythm means. It's a clockwise thing and it's largely driven by the sun. But I think there's benefits to doing something like a occasional 24 hour fast, dinner to dinner fasting, where let's say you had dinner tonight and then you just drink water teas, coffee, non-caloric drinks until dinner the next day. That's a nice clean out process that has phenomenal benefits. And then for your immune system and actually the activation of latent stem cells in our bodies as we get older, a three-day fast, 72 hours has been shown to activate those. So think of fasting more as a tool 
that you can pull in many different ways. And if you're a breakfast person, which I personally am with you, I've been eating breakfast earlier and not shifting back to like noon. I've been having meals earlier and I've tried all different frameworks. You can still incorporate different kinds of intermittent fasting. Now, the people that see a lot of body composition changes from intermittent fasting are typically people that add a lot of weight to lose. And they find that by restricting their time eating window, they're simply eating fewer calories. Because like, let's just say you have a 1500 calorie meal, you're going to be full for like six hours, four or five, six hours. Like, and because of that, if you're restricting your eating to like an eight hour window, I mean, good luck trying to eat another like five, 500,000 calories. So you're going to be in a net calorie deficit, which is a, a prerequisite for this body fat loss. So I guess it can help people control their calories if they do like that. Um, but I think it's totally fine to have breakfast. And I actually think it's well, the most important thing for people is to start to get a proactive with their nutrition and to commit to a schedule that works for them. Mm -hmm. And so for you, you're experimenting with a new schedule, but it's a conscious thing. It's like, this is the new thing that I'm trying. And because of that, you're now proactive with your nutrition plan. Not that you were reactive before, but I think the people that get in trouble don't have any scaffolding of structure with the nutrition. And maybe they skip a meal ad hoc here, then they're starving going into dinner and then they overeat, then they don't sleep well. And then the next day they're on the back foot. So simply by being productive or proactive in setting a schedule is like the key start. And then I think if someone has breakfast, they can still throw in a 24 hour fast for health benefits once in a while. And uh, yeah, I, and I'd say what I am learning too is so everyone's going to be very individual. There's some people who simply wake up and they're not hungry and they can go long periods of time without eating. Maybe they have coffee, some healthy fats in there, and that's great. And there's other people that do like to train in the morning, do feel like they work out better when they have a little more fuel in their system pre-workout. And if that's the case, figure out what that is for you and like stick to that plan. What works for you may not be the works for someone else. Like there's a bit of individual variation there and you got to find your specific plan. All that said, I still think the first meal of the day should be easy to digest. Something like the shakes, the eggs, the fruits, these are wonderful foods that don't have a lot of taxing GI stress and they fit in whether you're having breakfast or skipping it. Right. Because if you're having a big meal that's heavy to digest, it's going to suck on your energy and then yes. it's going to be a bad way to start the day. Digestion's <laughs> a resource. Yes. Yes, exactly. Can I ask you, have you heard of Prolon? It's it's a fast... For sure. I've actually, okay, that, I know, I know the CEO of the company. Yeah. And oh, it's wow, like a okay. fasting mimicking diet, yes. right? That's, I've, I've so, done that several times. So it's, it's five days and it's, yeah. you're getting some soups and some olives and very, very minimal food. Um, I've, I've done that twice and I found it was really great. I actually worked that every day, both times. Not crazy, nice. but I, I still, I had the energy to do it, which was really great. So that's like a spring cleaning, right? That's like a five day low calorie under five around 500 calories fast that still creates this catabolic environment but you can prolong it a little bit without feeling like you're totally taxed on just like a straight no calorie fast i think ideally for longevity it'd be a good thing to do that every 90 days every quarter if you can in a, in a perfect world and it doesn't have to be that frequent even doing it once per year has benefits but i mean if we think of our years in terms of structure and calendar every 90 days if you can do some kind of extended fasting it, it would be beneficial for our bodies Gotcha. Okay. And then I, one thing you mentioned, which I want to touch on is um, the changes over 40. So when you're younger, I feel like I'm just thinking back to my youth, you get away with so much more. You can, mm -hmm. you can go out for a night drinking with the boys, have no sleep, be hungover, yes. and then still be pretty productive and get a workout the next day. Whereas when you get older, it takes, you know, a, a alcohol, I actually gave up alcohol about six years yes. ago, but it, it would take me out for, if I, if I went out on a Saturday night, I didn't feel good till Tuesday. You know, yeah. I still did things that I tried to work out, but I just, it, the effects of it just hit me so hard. What, what is it about? Is it something about after 40, um, the body's just much more uh, fragile? For sure. I mean, and we, we lose this kind of resilience of our youth and it happens on every parameter. Our joints and our connective tissue gets weaker. Immune system gets a little more senescent and like, which means the immune cells aren't as, as functional. The liver parameters for processing alcohol can go down. Digestive systems can get a little more sensitive where we eat foods and we get inflamed or have bloating. You know, we absorb certain nutrients a little bit less. And I, this sounds terrible to say, but it's kind of the truth. Our bodies have this just natural trajectory um, of having a peak of our vitality and resilience and then having this decline. Now, just because there is a natural decline doesn't mean that you actually need to decline. It just means you need to buffer out the fact that there's slightly less resilience with an even more healthy and productive 
routine. And that are a lot of people who are actually healthier and fitter in their 60s than they were in their 30s because they have these right practices and better inputs. But it means we must be more conscious to maintain or even accelerate into greater levels of performance. We can't just like leave it to happenstance and accident. And right. quite frankly, I think that's why a lot of people do succeed more because they realize that there's now small things they do that can cause it big feedback loops, big problems. So it leads to big decisions like not drinking anymore or like hiring a trainer and getting into exercise or eliminating foods that aren't making us feel bad and committing to a really healthy diet. So there's, there's like wisdom in suffering, right? The suffering is like the course correction mechanism. And it's just a fact that it gets, it gets tighter and less forgiving as we get older, let alone the hormonal changes that happen to men and to women gradually, which are certainly being accelerated by our modern environment, which is, is not supporting us in many ways, shapes or forms. So there's a lot of factors and right. And that's why we look around and we see that most people over 40, at least in the United States, over half are overweight, obese, and on at least a couple of prescription medications. Like that is the nature of what happens unless you choose to do something differently. But you know, you make some new choices, you can have very different results from that. So Anthony, I'm from Europe originally, and one thing, uh, my mom's from the south of France, and she was just, she, had, she she goes between England and France, and she was just showing, she's actually in town this week visiting, she was showing me a photo of her friend in Cannes in the south of France, and her friend is in, in her 80s, and she looks like she's in her 60s, something about that Mediterranean diet, yeah. um, but in general, um, Anthony, do you mind me asking how old you are? Yeah, I'm in my 30s, I'm in my mid-30s right now, I was gonna I'm say, 34, uh, you, yeah. You, you look very young, but so, so maybe you... Maybe it's changed a bit because I'm, I'm a decade older, but I remember in my youth, you did not see women who were, you know, 50 and attractive that you do see today. Or yeah. you don't see these guys who are like in great shape and they look really youthful and they're in their 50s. It, so I feel like as uh, on the on the macro level, society's got much healthier, uh, unhealthier, like you said, like, you know, 50 people, um, 50% yeah. of above 40 are obese. But there's still there's these exceptions where they seem to almost defy aging. Um, mm -hmm. Is that because the? the do, do you know what? What? Why that is? Like, how come sure. when I was a kid, you didn't see people that were like they look so good as they're older? And now you see. It. Is it um, this this new trend of longevity? Like, if you make the effort, there's there's a lot of options available for you to, um, to you know to be really healthy in your older age. Or what do you think that is? A hundred percent. I mean, it's a it's a combination of culture and technology. I think on on the culture front, like fitness culture, at least in the West, the Western part of the world really only exploded over the last 100 years, maybe even less mm -hmm. than that. We're like becoming going to the gym is now fashionable. Supplements yes. are everywhere. You know, we have technologies through biohacking, like different lights and creams. We understand how to stimulate collagen. We understand things about detoxification and fasting. So it's a mix of knowledge and culture. So you're right. That is the promise. If you are in the know, you do have the type of knowledge that you're getting in this podcast and other kind of places that you can make better changes and have dramatically better results. At the same time, we are seeing a dramatic increase in diabetes heart disease, stress-related issues, sleep disorders from technology. So like the pressures are tremendous. But again, it's like like knowledge is a knife that can cut through this the, the, the currents that are bring, dragging many people down. So you have the promise to look fantastic. Uh, and I think there's a lot of cosmetic things that we do to make ourselves look good that don't necessarily mean that you're healthy on the inside, though. I think that is an important yes. thing, distinction to make. There are a lot of people that look very fit, that end up having pretty dramatic health outcomes. And sometimes it happens like seemingly out of nowhere. So we have the ability today to mask uh, what good health on the inside and good health on the outside is. Typically good health externally is, is, is representative of good internal health. But now between plastic surgeries, creams, lights, and things like this, there's a disjoint of those things. But by and large, you can be very healthy today, but it does require doing things differently than most people. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because society is in general pretty sick and unhealthy, so you have to you have to do things um, outside. Before we talk talk about like actual um, you know exercise and things like yeah. that, I'd love to talk a little bit more about um, well, two things really. Uh, Doctor Matthew Walker, I'm a big fan of him. I've mm -hmm. listened to a lot of his podcasts and read his book. And I think sleep is so important, and that's something yeah. that I struggle with because I have to you know my son wakes us up relatively early. And the evenings during the time I work for myself, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. There's always, you know, lots of emails to get to and work to do in the evening. So it's trying to, trying to, <laughs> trying to get that where I'm getting enough sleep, where I'm not impacting my health and my energy, but also just getting things done. And I know that's that's a problem for a lot of my busy friends. It's just the yeah. evenings they they don't they stay up too late. Um, and the other thing is sun. So when I was a kid, um, I was so um, my 
I was going to France a lot. My family, you know, like I said, my mom's from France. We would be in, on, you know, all summer I was on the beach in the south of France for three months. I was so yeah. tan. And then there was, there was, because when I was a kid, my parents thought the sun was healthy. Then there was this big thing where, like, no, no, skin cancer, the sun's really bad. So I tried to stay out of the sun for a long time. And then the last two, uh, 10 years or so, I feel so much better. And I don't get sunburned. Like I was out today. It's a nice sunny day. And I'm in Indiana. It was, you know, 82 degrees. I was out with my dogs and my shirt off for 20 minutes. And yeah. just, it, you know, I'm not getting burned. I'm not putting sun cream on, but I'm just getting that vitamin D. So I'd love mm-hmm. to hear a little bit about your thoughts on sleep and also is the sun good or is it bad? And I, I know it might give me a few wrinkles when I'm older, but if it makes me feel great and gives me energy, I'll take that trade off. You know, so For sure. the, 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 I mean, the sun thing, I'm, I'm very, I'm kind of confused about that. Well, I, I mean, uh, hopefully I can give some clarity. It's a topic I'm massively, massively passionate about. So I love that you brought up sleep and sun together because I think the conversation about sleep is really the conversation about circadian rhythm. And this means that we're talking about the evening time as well as the morning time. And the fact that all life on this planet is oriented to this sun, this, this energy emitting sun that basically allows all the plants to photosynthesize and creates a lot of biological effects with us. Let me just run through uh, first what happens to our bodies in relation to the light throughout the 24 hours, and then what sunlight actually is, the different wavelengths of stuff that comes off of the sun, as well as UV. So first off, in the morning, when we get morning sunshine, particularly on our eyes, it actually creates this cascade of neurochemical changes in brain regions directly connected to our eyes that allows us to produce serotonin. Serotonin is this feel-good neurotransmitter. And we all know the feeling we're out and it's a sunny day and we feel absolutely wonderful. We feel connected. We feel safe. We feel like everything's good. The stress levels are lower. And when people have depression, we give them drugs to literally increase serotonin. And our eyes are connected to the sun where we get this natural pharmacy when we get enough morning natural sunlight, we produce serotonin. And serotonin later in the day is actually converted to melatonin is through the pineal gland, this really important area of the brain that when light goes down in our ambient environment, our brain secretes melatonin. And melatonin is so much more than just like a sleep hormone. It's anti-inflammatory from the brain. It helps It helps really just like rejuvenate our cells and kick off this whole cascade of regeneration. And so we need both the morning sunshine and this evening light exposure. And technology and the fact that we have all these lights and electricity and the different wavelengths of the blue light later in the day has gotten us out of sync with this rhythm. And then to your point as well, people have gotten very fearful of the sun because we heard about the skin aging and sun cancer. And there's truth to that, but only in certain instances. So when we look at the sunlight, we look up in the sky, sunlight itself is about 40% visible light. And that's the light that we see reflected off of objects. It's around 40% infrared light. So infrared is the things we get when we go into the saunas and we get the the light therapies and machines. It is massively beneficial for increasing collagen. It helps our mitochondria work better, increases circulation. So infrared is so beneficial for us. And get this, around 40% of sunlight is infrared. And then the remaining bit is UV light. And UV, it comes in two forms, UVA and UVB. UVA is the kind of light that photo ages us. It makes our skin look a little more wrinkly. UVB is the kind of light that can burn us. It can burn us, but that's UVB light is also the kind of light that produces vitamin D. Mm. So that's fascinating. And, and what I think what's important to understand is morning sunshine around the one to two hours between the sun comes up actually has very little to no UV radiation reaches you. When the sun is low on the horizon, you don't get a lot of UV exposure. You're just getting the the near infrared light as well as the full spectrum light. So my point is saying this, if anyone has the ability to season willing and location willing, get that morning sunshine with basically no worries that you're going to like age yourself or, or really get a burn or anything like that. But you are prepping your body with this natural infrared and you're also getting this natural light pharmacy to kick in that's going to help you later in the night. Now, Vitamin D is part of the picture, right? Our skin can synthesize with sunlight and cholesterol. We can make a very powerful form of vitamin D, which is essential. Like every single your, every single one of your white blood cells has a vitamin D receptor. It's so important. And for men, it increases testosterone levels, greater immune strength, the bone and calcium metabolism. It's really important. And the interesting thing is we only synthesize vitamin D when the sun is at the high level 
in the middle of the day. That's the same time we can get burned. But what research shows is if you got early morning sun exposure from that near infrared light, it actually tonifies your skin and gets it ready as almost like a natural kind of sunscreen that makes you less resistant uh, to or more resistant to burning later in the day. So we're meant, wow. as our ancestors did, to get this full spectrum array of the light. And then later in the day, when the sun goes down around that evening time, it's also a time where there's very little UV radiation in the one hour before sunset. But what does it look like? That sun looks red. We're getting the reds and the oranges that come off that sunset. Well, those particular wavelengths of light are massively healing for us. This is like they really help increase cellular respiration. They help with collagen, all the same things the infrared does, the red light does too. Now, when we look up in the sky in the middle of the day, the sky typically looks blue. What is that? Well, that's actually blue light coming from the white light of the sun that's scattered across the nitrogen, oxygen, helium, different, different molecules that are floating around in the air. And so with the blue light itself is very energizing for us. We're meant to be exposed to blue light in the middle of the day. The problem is we have phones that kick off artificial blue light constantly throughout the time. So the key is to entrain your blue light exposure to the time when you're naturally getting ambient blue light from the sun. So this is the whole picture of sleep is certainly entraining light patterns in a very big way. And so practically speaking, what I will try to do is sometime in the morning before the sun gets too hot and season willing, I'll get outside, I'll take a walk, I'll breathe through my nose and I'll get full body sun exposure, 10 to 15 minutes. And for men, they literally find that if you get full body sun exposure, including your testicles, it will raise testosterone levels. It will help in, in that respect too. And I'm not saying everyone should go around like walk around naked, but like <laughs> this is the facts. It's really good for our bodies even to get that full body sun exposure. So morning sunshine is very good. It'll help you sleep later in the day. If you can catch the sunset time as well, there are benefits for it as well from those certain wavelengths. And I think if you can get out in the middle of the day, even for five, 10 minutes, Depending on your skin tone, don't burn yourself, but just a little bit of exposure can get you a natural bump in vitamin D. But I don't think we should rely on the sun strictly for you know vitamin D exposure because our, our world also goes through different cycles of how much ozone we have depending on where you live. And so right now we're going into a period, and this is just a natural shift rhythm of how the earth and the sun interact, where our ozone layer is getting thinner. And I'm sure we're accelerating that with different man-made stuff, but also it just goes through its own rhythm. When ozone gets more thin, we're going to have more of the UVA, UVB coming through, which can be burning and somewhat photo aging. So it's good, I think, still for people to supplement with some vitamin D. And that's found in many foods and many supplements. The things we should eat has good vitamin D. But I think outside of the vitamin D story, morning sunshine is your friend, get some of that, kick off that pharmacy. Uh, and I'll pause there because I'm sure you have some comments, but then I think it's a nice segue to get into sleep and what to do to like maximize that regenerative cycle. Hmm. Well, um, that's one thing I, I heard from a good friend of mine whose dad's um, a very successful doctor and just such a smart guy on so many different things. And he, he told my friend, he said, if there's one supplement to take, especially living in Chicago, you know, I, I'm just, just, I just moved out of Chicago to North West Indiana, but I'm basically in the Chicago climate where the winters are very cold. You don't get much daylight. He said it's, it's essential to be taken. He was saying, I think 5,000 to 10,000 yeah. um, IUs of vitamin D, which is a big amount. Um, so that's something I think I, he said that a couple of years ago. It's my friend. My friend told me I started taking vitamin D then and I felt much better. So that's definitely in the winter. Um, that's something that, that, that I do. Yes. Is th those lamps that I actually just bought one last winter and I was so busy, I kept forgetting to use it. But if you live in a climate where it's very cold and you're not, not getting much sun in the winter, are those lamps that are supposed to wake you up in the morning, are they... Are they kind of just nonsense? or, or they, they won't create vitamin D, but they will give you the benefit of that full spectrum white light that kicks off that serotonin perspective. Oh, so like those sure. lamps okay. that kick off the white light are going to yes. change the seasonal affective disorder, but they're not kicking out ultraviolet radiation, the UVB, which synthesizes vitamin D through your skin. If you went to a tanning bed, which mm -hmm. tans you by emitting UVB, which I do not recommend you necessarily do, that would increase vitamin D synthesis on the skin. But the lights are beneficial. And I guess like what I'm trying to make a point of is helping people understand this is that there's a couple mechanisms. Vitamin D is part of the light picture, but like the light itself and the other spectrums of light, like the near infrared and the full spectrum white light that we get from the sun also has other benefits outside of D. But look, the reason that vitamin D seems like a lot of vitamin D is quite frankly, because our, our recommended daily intakes of that stuff are absolutely jacked up. Like it's just, they're way too low and they haven't been updated yet. 
And 5,000 okay. IUs, you know, can be totally safe for people to take, particularly through the winter months. There are people that took up to 50,000 IUs for like six plus months. And I don't recommend people do that by any means. That's really, really excessive. But like they've had safe levels of vitamin D throughout that. And our, our vitamin D stores actually get depleted when we're in very stressful periods of our life, like having young kids. So there's even added benefits to necessarily taking more of that vitamin D. If you find that you're getting sick fairly frequently, which I'd say you have the sniffles like once, one to two times per month, if you're getting something, mm -hmm. increase your vitamin D intake. You should not be getting uh, sick that much because it's not just what we're exposed to. It's the terrain of our bodies. And vitamin D is a huge part of that picture. That's fascinating. Um, well, before you talk about sleep, I just want to say um, there's one thing, Anthony, that I know there's... I, and I'm, I don't know this. I'm assuming you're going to say something about if you can get up early with the sun and kind of keep that, you know, up early, um, go to sleep early. I am such a night owl genetically. Mm -hmm. So both my parents are night owls. I was working as a trader in the Chicago Board of Trade yeah. for a decade. I had to be at work at six. I was up at five every day. I hated every single morning, every single day. I just, I just don't, I, I, I'm, I'm just my, my brain, my mood, everything at night is better. And I recently read something from an evolutionary perspective saying that humans evolved in these hunter-gatherer bands, you know, of 200 people or 100 people. Yeah. And the reason that you have the the uh, morning people and the evening people is that if everyone was a morning person at night, the tribe would be under huge risk. Yeah. So by having people with different evolutionary, um, you know, tendencies to prefer yeah. the mornings for the evenings, it makes sense from from a from a hunter-gatherer group. And I was like, that's absolutely fascinating. I don't know it if is. it's true, but it makes sense. And I know yeah. 100% both my parents are night owls. I'm a night owl. And I've got friends who I've traveled with who are just the opposite of me. They roll out of bed at 6 a.m. They're wide, wide awake. They want to go for a run. But I'm having a mid-conversation with them at 10 p.m. And they're they're asleep. <laughs> you know, like, we're, we're like halfway through a conversation and I'll see that passed out. So it's, just, it's so interesting to see that. Um, so that's one thing I know. That's one of the problems with looking at all this stuff on something like Instagram where people are pushing yeah. these certain routines. And one of the reasons I really like you is because you talked a lot about with diet too. You have to find out yes. what works for you. Some people do very well on a, on a vegan diet. Other people yes. need much more, you know, protein. So um, I'd love to hear a bit of your thoughts on for sleep. For sure. And I'll say this too. Well, those are what you described are called like chronotypes and people have yes. different varieties, the, the early morning, the night owls. And like, you're right, we have them. It's just stri stri strictly the facts. And I'll say that those chronotypes do often, well, not the chronotypes change, but like they're seasonal fluctuations. Like right now in the summer where the sun sets like much later, you know, and like it's lighter, oftentimes people find they're a little more phase shifted and stay up a little bit later than in times when it's really, you know, winter time and the sun goes down earlier, people tend to get to bed earlier. So we're at the effect of the seasons as much as we all have a predisposition to be shifted on a certain way. And actually they find that people who are in their chronotypes, if they get them off of that, so for you being a more of a night owl, and then if they try to force you into, you know, a different kind of chronotype and then they feed you food and they look at your insulin and glucose response, it's all jacked up. It's not nearly as good. Your body perceives that as a little more stressful. So there's an innate natural rhythm that we all have, and we should try to guide and like have a little bit of self-reflection to see where do we fit into these particular pictures. Now, I will say this, for people who are in the night hour or the later chronotype, it's still a good idea not to eat a ton of food really late at night. So yes. if you are doing something like getting into a little bit of a fasted period, I'd say still have dinner at like a reasonable time, which, you know, in the United States might be six, six, seven, you know, eight o'clock at the latest. And if you're in Europe, that might be like eight, nine, you know, o'clock or whatever. But like, you know, there's a little shift to it, but try not to eat a huge, try to be at least in a digested state for like three hours before you go to bed, even if you do tend to stay up later, because it can be great and you can have really productive time at night. But still, I would say try to stay in that fasted and trained uh, rhythm, even if you do stay up later at night. But yeah, there's a lot of individual variety in this. And even if you are a later stay up person, that still means you get up in the morning, maybe it's a little more of a wake up at like eight, nine o'clock or something like this. And now you're still getting morning light and you're in training your rhythm even more into the thing. So you can still, you're just a shifted, you're on the same rhythm, you're just shifted a little bit. And it's like, when we look at a bell curve and it's like standard deviations, it's like, we're all kind of like fitting on the outsides of this through line. So there's no like perfect fit for everyone. We're kind of looking at population level things, but find where you fit in there and still do the same things. So not too much food too late and light in the morning. Mm, I couldn't agree more. Um, talking about sleep, and um, I recently read, um, oh, I, I, I'm about a third of the way through um, this book. I wrote it down. What's it? I don't know the name. It's called uh, Why we Caffeine sleep? Blues. Okay. Um, and by Dr. Stephen Chemensky. And it's that the subtitle is 
wake up to the hidden danger of America's number one drug. And what he's saying is, you know, he said over 80% of people in America are completely addicted to caffeine and there's so many negative side effects, but very few people want to talk about it because, the, you know, like the doctors that might say something about it, they're also addicted to it too. And I've yeah. noticed, you know, if I look at the things that I'm not happy about, the two biggest things that me personally want to change is um, sleeping a little bit more and uh, cutting down on my caffeine. So one of the reasons I got yeah. that cold plunge is instead of waking up and being, yeah. I'm not a morning person, I roll out of bed, I jump in that thing. It's like having a double shot of espresso. It gets me, it gets my mind alert. Um, so I love that. But do you have any thoughts on like your personal caffeine consumption and, and caffeine in general? For sure. And and I'll say one thing about the cold plunge is like, obviously those are becoming more popular and fashionable these days. And I think they're going to continue to because in the morning, like they find that you do a cold plunge, you get a raise in your noradrenaline and adrenaline and dopamine levels equivalent to people who like took a, a bump of cocaine, but it actually is a lot more persistent. Like it is a, it is activates a pharmacy of these alertness, motivational, feel good neurotransmitters early in the day. So cold is another thing that's very beneficial and plays into this whole circadian rhythm that we can talk about on the sleep front. Now, yeah. like how does caffeine work? Well, one of the the main way that caffeine works by increasing alertness is actually blocking a receptor in our brain for ADP, which is a byproduct of ATP. So it blocks ADP receptors in the brain. So it gives us the sense that we're more alert. It's almost like blocking the feeling of being tired as opposed to just giving us energy. So it's like yeah. always we're borrowing a little bit from the future when we do use caffeine. And it is slightly taxing on the nervous system. You know, when we're when we're pushing ourselves, we're always like our nervous system is either in this parasympathetic or sympathetic drive. And caffeine is inherently going to be like pushing the gas a little bit into sympathetic drive, which has benefits. Like it's very clear, like caffeine is a is an athletic performance ergogenic aid. It increases like power output at high doses, delays time to fatigue. And it's like, it, it's very good in certain contexts, but when it becomes our baseline and our nervous system needs to be regulated by exogenous caffeine, I think that's when we get into a little bit of trouble. And so today I took caffeine. Like I took a, a cup of coffee and I had uh, a little bit of caffeine tea kind of like focus things. I have many of these types of conversations and I like to be a little bit more alert. The four or five days before that, I didn't have caffeine. And there was a little bit of like a, a tolerance break, if you will, on that. So where I personally like to find myself is not needing it, not having it as a, as a daily must have, but I can use it as a tool when I need be. And it took me a while to come to terms with that. Like I was definitely, when I was a bodybuilder, all the fat burning stimulants I was using were super heavy in caffeine. And I drank coffee for years and years and years. Um, and I, I think the research is clear that you can have a long, healthy life by including coffees and some caffeine sources in there. But I think anything that the nervous system ultimately becomes dependent on to feel at normal baseline is kind of tapping into the reserves. And I'll also say this, for maximizing your longevity in a graceful way, our bodies are meant to be in a parasympathetic state. We don't want to have high blood pressure. We want to be relaxed. We want to be breathing through our nose. And, and quite frankly, the, the level of focus that we have when our brain is in that kind of like very focused, but still alert, kind of like Zen, if you will, state, the brain is in alpha wave activity. Alpha is like a way that we can measure the brain's activity. And when we have caffeine and stimulants, we get into beta waves, which are a little more anxious, a little more alert, a little more keyed up. So even the way our, our brain responds to caffeine, it's 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 not going to be uh, optimal for if if our goal is to feel like we're in this flow, peaceful state that has energy that's naturally produced. And I think that everyone, because of their different genes and the liver enzymes that process caffeine has a different sensitivity to these things. I think most people here listening to this should take a caffeine tolerance break. It sucks. Mm -hmm. There's no other way around it, but it's a good idea once in a while to like reset your baseline by getting off of it for a week. And it's not fun. There is mood changes. There is could be headaches, there could be just, you know, changes to overall vitality, but it's good to hit the reset button once in a while. Um, because quite frankly, it is it is an external thing that we use to prop ourselves up for energy. But I think it's a tool too. Um, and I think if you get to the point where you know, you're not sleeping well, and caffeine is impacting that, it's a good idea to take a tolerance break. 100%. Yeah, no, I, I, the, the way even just the way you talk, and so you're very, um, you can always tell like a bullshit artist when they're very like, you got to do this, this, this. But the way I, I know you're, you're very good at what you do and you know your stuff because the way you're described, the, this, the, even, even the words you're choosing. So you didn't say, yeah, caffeine's terrible. You said, I use it. 
But if you feel like you're using it too much, maybe take a break to reduce your tolerance. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I'm just so, I'm so grateful we're having this conversation because I really Me can too. tell you, you know your stuff. Um, but so it's a good, caffeine's one, a good fat loss agent. You know, it controls appetite well. and it increases metabolism by about 10. percent So like, there's benefits to it, right? I mean, there's benefits, right. but but again, for for sleep, it's not your friend, and particularly if you're having some later caffeine. Not great. Some uh, some options to get off caffeine that may be interesting to people. Uh, you can. There's an herb called rhodiola, which is a powerful adaptogen that can help, like basically help you wean off caffeine. It's it's energizing in a slightly different way. A lot of people use other adaptogenic mushrooms. You know, mm-hmm. some that are actually energizing. It would be something like cordyceps. Lion's mane is very good for focus. So there's things that are a little more like long term, happy and sustainable that are good. And then. I guess uh, everyone, uh, someone that many people do know of is uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman on YouTube and in, in some of his He's lectures. Great. One thing that he talks about quite a bit is even delaying the the intake of caffeine early in the morning. So instead of having it immediately, even waiting one hour before you have your first caffeine can help uh, prevent some of that crash that many of us feel and experience. Because again, the way caffeine works is it blocks the ADP in the brain. So if we wait a little bit and we clear out some of that ADP just through some movement, through some sunshine, then have the coffee a little bit later, there can be benefit. And the final thing I'll say too is, is it can find for people who are having caffeine that still want to have energy that feel like they need multiple cups. If you add some like MCT oil or some healthy fats to your coffee and you, you make it a little more of a thing, sometimes that can help lead to more stable time released, slower caffeine drip than just having like a straight black cup or whatever, or shooting it down and shooting the next one down. You can kind of prolong it out. So that's my take on the caffeine. How's your your sleep, Anthony? Are you very religious, making sure you get a certain amount of sleep, or yeah, you, well, is it easy for you? For sure, it, it it is because I have many years of like good habits. But that's not to say that I'm at the stage in my life where I'm super militant. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's ten thirty one. I should have been in bed a minute ago. Um, this is the part of the part of the the caffeine picture. It kind of ties in. What our bodies need is certainly sleep, but we also need rest. And we need rest and rest can be cultivated while we're in the waking state as well. Like you can have two people who have the same day and while someone's like super keyed up, anxious, mental, emotional, high blood pressure, sympathetic driving, you have another person go through the same exact tasks, but do it in a more relaxed way. The more you have the ability to stay in a more relaxed state, the nervous system is more parasympathetic, the less you need to like absolutely require to have that sleep. And I still think sleep is vital, but I also want people to understand the overall nervous system tone throughout the day. So if you can cultivate a more peaceful, connected, present way of living, it's it plays into your sleep. They're not two separate things. Now with sleep, like I, I do have like pretty solid sleep rituals. I think it all does start with not eating too late. It's one of the, not eating too late and quite frankly, drinking alcohol or smoking things, you know, whatever people like to do in those things are absolutely the gateways to destroying your sleep. Too much digestive activity creates heat in the body. When we want to sleep, the body wants to be in a cooler, darker environment. So too much metabolic activity is sending weird signals to your body. Your body's like, I want to allow the organs to rest. And you're like, just kidding. Try try to deal with this giant steak. So like, there's a little bit of disconnect there. Um, And I think part of sleep is fascinating because it's certainly physical and physiological in terms of the body getting into this really deep, relaxing state, the brain waves changing, but also it's like a mental process for people. There's a lot of people who have sleep issues, not because of like a physical basis, but largely because their minds race and they don't know how to manage their thoughts and their emotions. So the practices that I have around that was, you know, I, I became a, a an avid meditator and now it's kind of turned into meditation slash prayer. But I, I, I do that in the morning and in the evening. And I find it's a very important time to start to make these transition phases into the day a lot more graceful. And in the process, the benefit that I've experienced is a mind that's more clear, a far less reactive, and has the ability to kind of like take thoughts and put them down and not allow them to continue to ruminate, which are, you know, takes time. It's a practice. um, But I guess this is ultimately the quality of your life every single day. What more is there to work on than effectively changing your inner world and your outer experience of it? But I like to pray and meditate. And the way that I do that consistently is actually keep a little meditation chair like in, in, in my room that I go to bed that's dedicated for that spot. So there's an environment, a location, a trigger, and I won't really lay down and and go to sleep until I've spent a few minutes just like sitting in that chair, even if it's one minute, but oftentimes it's more because it's become more enjoyable for me to do that. But it's just a little bit of a a consistent anchor at the end of my day. 
Um, now, because I'm in, I'm in the know on this stuff and I have a lot of good health habits, I do some other things to help sleep. Like I used a pulsed electromagnetic frequency pad, PEMF, which is a, it's basically a pad that has some electric coils that can kick out different kind of electromagnetic wavelengths that can help get the body into a relaxed state. I have one of those things. It absolutely helps with sleep. Um, I'm a big fan of people getting adequate magnesium intake throughout the day, but particularly at night, magnesium is a powerful mineral for relaxing the system. I'm a big fan of people using different kinds of herbal teas to help relax. Chamomile, lavender, uh, holy basil. These are teas that have a lot of research backing them and they're very good for relaxing the nervous system. And then for short periods of time, if you're having sleep disturbances or if you have a lot of light exposure or if you're under stress, using melatonin can be helpful in the short term. It's interesting because it's not one of those exogenous hormones where you take it like something like testosterone for men and it shuts down your own internal production, but it can be, it can be a crutch. So if I have really long computer days and I'm just like cranking, I still have like blue light filters, but on that day, I might take a little bit of a, a melatonin on a given day. But for me, it's not like an every night kind of thing. Although some people certainly feel like that's that. But I kind of feel like if you're on the heavy stimulant train, then you feel like you need stuff to hit the gas. If you're in the gas in the morning, then you need to slam on the brakes in the evening. That's where you feel exhausted over time where yes. you need to play this dance. And I think it's better to be a little more even keel, easier said than done. But these small action steps do add up over time. Well, I love what you said about routines because I'm sure you're like me in the sense that you you make tweaks, but you have your routine pretty much set mm -hmm. and it works well for you. And I think that's when you talked about decision fatigue earlier, People that live a very unhealthy lifestyle, maybe they start working with you and they want to they want to be healthy. The, the best thing is you, know, you can't have 50 decisions a day. You have to just say, yes. like with this cold plunge, I hate the mornings and I hate the cold. So it's I don't wake up and say, oh, shall I do it today? I said, I'm, I got it. I said, I'm going to do it every single day for the rest of my life. You know, <laughs> like I, I don't even give myself the chance. It's my routine and that's it. Mm -hmm. And otherwise it's too hard. Um, stress. You talk about stress and you seem like you're a very calm guy. One thing when I was young, I always thought stress was good because, you know, yeah. uh, I was in combat sports, that's stressful. Um, I prided myself on the ability to handle a lot of things. And recently I've been, I've been really coming around to the idea that I got to work on reducing my stress in different areas yeah. of my life. And, um, I know you, in, in your notes, you, that's a topic you'll, you'll find talking. Um, uh, Warren Buffett is, I think he's in his nineties. He seems like he has pretty good energy from, from what I've read. He lives a very unhealthy lifestyle. He'll have like, you know, McDonald's for lunch with diet with Coke and you know soft drinks and all that stuff. But one thing he's been very adamant the last you know decades of his life is he always takes time to, you know, a couple of hours in his day. He never has a busy schedule. He always has in his schedule time to just be by himself, think, relax, walk, de-stress. And I thought that was so interesting. Um yeah. it, 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 I, and just looking at the world around me. I think stress is a huge thing, especially with busy people, successful in brackets, people, entrepreneurs, people that are tied to their phones. Um, it, it, that's a very stressful way of living. And you, and you mentioned the screens too. That's yeah. one thing that I really struggle with because I work in real estate and it's a, a nature of the business is you're, you're sending a lot of texts, you're doing a lot of calls sure. and you're sending a lot of emails. So I'm dealing with the screens and the stress of, of people always trying to get hold of you. Um, yeah. Do you have any any tips on that or things you help people with? Um, that want to be healthier. For sure. And I want to repeat what I said before, because I believe it's foundationally true. We've heard the analogy that you only have so many heartbeats in your life. I don't yes. know what the, what the trillions of heartbeats it is, but how, whatever the billion, hundred billion, whatever heartbeats that you do have. And effectively what stress is, is like hitting that on 1.5 times speed. It's like speeding up through that. It's it's creating uh, a faster cardiovascular rhythm. It's creating more mental activity in the brain. It's like revving the whole system up and you're kind of like speeding through things, which ultimately pays the price of burning your life wick even faster. And we also know like stress, what happens biochemically when we get stressed or we experience stress um, is these adrenal glands on top of our kidneys. It's their job to release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. These are some of the main ones. One of cortisol's jobs, because it is to re respond to acute stress. So it increases blood sugar. It liberates sugar from, from cells because it's like, we might need energy. Let's get that into the bloodstream. It squashes your immune system because your immune system is energetically like expensive. And if you're dealing with short-term stress, why do you need to worry about long-term immune system things? You don't. You need acute energy. It decreases all of your collagen, so it makes you age faster. It increases your blood pressure because it needs to have you ready to respond to things. The mess that that happens chronically. And I think the uh, the interesting thing about stress is partly there's environmental stresses. Like if you and I were in a bank and there was like a, a hostage situation where someone comes in, like 
that's an external environment that creates like a, like something, a very powerful, like stressor. Maybe you lose your job or maybe something happens with one of your kids or something like that. That's a powerful stressor. But I think by and large, the main stresses that many of us encounter are how we relate to the things in our lives. It's like mm -hmm. the stories and the relationship that we have to what's happening. Um, and so I, it is like, this is where health in the mind become very much intertwined. It's like our thoughts are literally going to signal our endocrine glands and how we respond to things to create stress hormones, which changes our genetic expression, which is called epigenetics, which makes it more likely that we're going to have like a stress response later. It's like people who go to war and see absolutely horrible things have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, where there's been such a powerful imprint into their mind of something that is perceived as traumatic that it literally triggers this stress response in relation to some everyday things. And so I guess we're all kind of having that in, in, a, in a certain context. So that's like one aspect. It's like looking at our relationship to things. And this is where I think we get into the intersection of health with personal development and maybe even spirituality, where we must start to analyze our attachments to the thoughts that come up, start to learn how to calm the mind and cultivate more inner peace. Like it's obviously possible, but it does create it require effort and it requires this process of getting committed to it. And that's why... I'm telling you as a guy who's very invested in health that the morning and evening meditation practices of just learning how to like still my mind and create some bookends and allow things to relax and move through me and not hold on to things. I'm I'm basically like discharging static at the end of every day and not allowing that stuff to create bigger loops that I'm going to have to deal with into the future. So that's a huge part of health. And then there's the other aspect of the addicted brain that is largely being created through our technologies right? These things that we use, whether it's people constantly pinging us or the social networks, they're designed to play on our neural circuitry, in particular, the, the brain regions associated with reward, that basically every time we are seeking something and it's that craving and we're about to have it, the same feeling that we get when we're pulling something at the casino, like the lottery to hit the jackpot, or we're looking at pornography, or we're excited about the next big win in business. These kinds of things are dopamine hits. And quite frankly, we're training our brains to constantly need these things through our technology. And that has has an impact because it kind of creates a mind that is used to uh, being in this agitated, never arriving kind of state. And that's the difference between what many of us feel like we want to have, which is peaceful, content, productive, in service, successful, connected, and safe. Like, it's a different neurochemistry. That's neurochemistry that's largely driven by serotonin, which again is created through sunlight among and so good social connections and other things. So I bet if we looked at Warren Buffett and we could like dissect his brain and then measure some neurochemicals, Warren Buffett probably has very stable levels of dopamine. He has a lot of serotonin from connection and security. He has a deep sense of purpose. So in spite of the fact that he might be eating foods that are somewhat or probably pretty inflammatory, he like he has a lot of these other benefits. And, and also the problem is some people have genes that are very associated with longevity, like in spite of themselves, drinking whiskey and smoking, they may live a long time. Most of us probably have a mixed bag where some things and we have certain genetic risk factors, but I'll tell you this, like we must get at the root of stress. And part of the way to get through the root of stress is to actually do exercise on a regular basis, which is a voluntary use stress. The more we exercise our, our physical body becomes more adapt to like to having stress, we must manage our stimulant intake and our sleep because that is the tone of our nervous system, which helps us respond to stress. Like if I want to destroy your system, I would keep you up for three or four days and have you do like intense exercise and drink a bunch of coffee. Like that would wreck you. It would, it would wreck anybody. And, 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 you know, there's periods that we can go hard and fast, but we're ultimately burning a candle that's going to have a, a big impact. And as I said before, the final thing is our relationship to our thoughts and our feelings. And I wish I could give you a very clear roadmap of how we navigate that, but like that's that's our lives. That's the mental and emotional experience of our lives, and and that interplays with our biology. Anthony, are you good with time? I got a few more things to. Yeah. To, okay, good. Let's go. Because I'm so so glad you brought that up. So we haven't even got to, got to talk about working out yet. Which is, if I had had this conversation ten years ago, it would have been the first thing I was going to ask you. Oh, what do you you know? Um, what are your thoughts on you know cardio versus lifting mm -hmm. weights versus this yoga? But all this other stuff is is stuff that I've just come to realize more and more is so important. Yeah. But the mindset thing. So I'm at the stage of my life, um, and I feel like my life right now is so chaotic. I'm juggling so many different personal goals, career, a wife, a son. We're trying for number two. I just moved states and moved house, and yeah. I've got so many things I'm trying to juggle: a social life and all these different these different things. And every now and again, it gets me a little bit frustrated. And then I heard this 
beautiful thing by another longevity doctor, Dr. Peter Atia. And he said mm -hmm. he used to get really upset when his kids were young and they had their toys everywhere and he was living in this mess and he could never keep it tidy. And then he thought, my 80-year-old self, if he was having a conversation with me and the kids are long gone and he's an old man, he's living by himself, he's like, wouldn't you give a bit of this chaos to be back here again, to have your kids reliant on you and yeah. you know they're three years old and five years old? And so that's I've got that and it had the most beautiful realization. And this is probably at midnight yeah. the other night. And I just it just had this come to me a few days ago where all the things that bother me, they are, I want to say, you know, uh, first world problems. And even, sure. even, you know, financial stress and all this other stress, I should be so grateful to have what I have. And yeah. I got to stop wanting to have my life, like every, everything at peace. It's just a, a change of mindset. I, I, I now, when I trip over my son's toys, it makes me smile. Cause I know that yeah. I'm going to, when I, when I, when I'm an old man, I'm going to look back at this exact period as, oh, they were the best of times, the golden years. Yeah. So like, it's, it's, it's very hard to appreciate the great things when you're in them. And that's something yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned mindset because I, with all my, um, with all my boxing fights and MMA fights when I was younger, I had so much anxiety. If someone had asked me, you know, a week before, like, Hey, if you could just click your fingers and and, and be done with this week, so you can just relax again afterwards, um, would you do it? And I said, of course, I, I, I didn't enjoy that stressful period. I know it was necessary for my growth and my goals, but I didn't enjoy it. And mm -hmm. it was only the very last fight when I decided I was going to retire after this that I was like, okay, this is the last time I'm going to do this. And I enjoyed every single process. And thankfully I won, which made it better. But yeah. it, it's the whole thing. I remember it so clearly, whereas the others were just a blur because it was just something I was trying to get through. And I just think that's such an important point to harp on because you mentioned a few times, just the mindset. Mindset is so yeah. important because it's not like that stoic um, philosophy. It's not whether whether things are good or bad in our life that makes us happy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's us choosing to be happy with what we have. Yeah. And and I just yeah. I, I feel like I'm 44 years old and I've finally come to this realization. And I wish I'd come to it earlier, but it's a really beautiful place to be. And just anyone listen to this, trust me, I have my own fair share of problems. I had a contractor rip me off. I'm in a lawsuit. You know, he stole all, all my 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 uh, my savings. Like I, I've got a lot of bullshit that I'm dealing with. My life is great. I'm not saying it's not, but I, th I think I, I don't have to have all these problems solved in order to be happy. I've just made that conscious choice, and so I'm so yeah. glad you brought that up. Well, I want to comment on that. It's really beautiful. And I want to say like, welcome to your season of life of living in wisdom. Like it's beautiful. And like, I think you know that lesson now because you've experienced it so powerfully. And I maybe gratitude, that experience of being grateful for what is and what we have is the antidote experience to stress. Yes. Stress is like, I want this to be different than what it is. And gratefulness is like, man, this is so special. I'm so glad it's exactly the way it is. And can we be grateful for every single experience in our lives? You know, I think perhaps like in hindsight, maybe like years down the way with the right kind of mindset, it's maybe possible. Like if somebody can be possible that they, they, they're grateful that they experienced a rape or something that was seemingly horrible at the time, because in, in hindsight, it led to great, great awakenings and different perspectives. And so we all have the benefit to relate to the circumstances in our life in many different ways. And maybe the simple practice is just in cultivating some gratitude in the morning, the evening, during those little bookend times, it'll start to retrain the mind to have a habit of like being happy with what is and, and not being as resistant. So beautiful. And I mean, we know that the people who live the longest, the centenarians, those pockets of longevity, the people that have been living the longest without like biomedical technological intervention. These are people that spend a lot of time outside. They eat natural foods. They have great social connections. They do lots of daily activity uh, and they have a faith or a strong spiritual component. And so like, it's kind of like the lifestyle that we've, we've discussed here. It's like, they're keeping themselves in this relaxed, connected state. Uh, and, and, and yeah, so, I mean, we, we live in a busy time now and I, I will personally reflect in my life. I think we all need to get real about our level of bandwidth. And I think our bandwidth is largely increased by our health. So when you get yourself healthy through proper nutrition, exercise inputs, supplements, et cetera, all the stuff we started to talk about today, you get more bandwidth to handle more. And I think everyone also has their own unique amount of bandwidth. There's some people that can only handle three to four things at a time. There's some people that actually can handle 10 or 15 things at a time. But when you get real about self-knowledge about where you fall in there, you can get yourself as best you can through removing things in your life in a place that's within context. I think you can be one or two things too many and be okay. But when you feel like four or five and you feel absolutely overwhelmed, is there something that we can cut out 
Um, and I know sometimes when I've had too many business ventures or too many other things on top of family or other, other aspects, like in my bandwidth two taps, that's when, that's when stress becomes like just generalized anxiety, as opposed to responding to an acute stress. And I guess less is more in our very busy, fast paced world. If there's stuff we can eliminate, that's good. And also asking ourselves like, why do we actually need certain things? Like, I think we we don't always evaluate our motives. We just kind of like repeat the same patterns all the time because it's the habit, but maybe there's things that we can simplify in our lives. Um, and, and that would be beneficial for our health. I love that. Cause so many times when you say, if I, if me personally, I have so much, so little free time, every time I say yes to a social commitment, I'm right. saying no to maybe a workout or some mm-hmm. some time with my son or getting a good night's sleep. The, the, everything in life is trade-offs. And that's another yes. thing that I've, I've come to realize. Um, but Anthony, I've got to talk to you about your, you know, some of your favorite exercise modalities yeah. because that that was uh, that was what I was really excited to talk about. Right now, I'm I'm trying to do a bit of everything. I'm trying to do some cardio work, some yeah. weight weightlifting work, some kind of yoga stretching recovery yeah. work. Um do, do when someone comes to you and and, and they 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 kind of they're almost like a piece of clay and they're like, you know. Anthony, like, what do you recommend in terms of exercise? Do you have some some um, specific protocols, or is that really based on their goals? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do have specific like programmatic advice, and like what you said again, your questions are so good, and how you think about things, like whether it's intuitive or just you've done a lot of study, you got this figured out. There's like really three categories of exercise we need to do over forty to stay well: strength training and resistance work. For strong muscles and the metabolic benefits that come with that. Cardiovascular work for the heart. It's the main organ that gives us this vitalizing blood. And the reason, main reason why people over 40 die is heart disease. And third is flexibility and mobility work because the quality of our bodies, how much pain we're in, how healthy our spine is, is what really matters a lot when we're 70, 80 beyond. And so for really busy people, the cool thing is you can collapse all those down into one workout that hits all of these elements. And, I'll, and, and I call it metabolic resistance training. We take like the foundational strength moves that you want to be strong at when you're 70 or 80, which is like, if we look at this body in geometry, we're built on a central axis and we have all these appendages and it can move in certain space. We can push things overhead and we can pull things down. That's a shoulder press. That's a lat pull down or chin up. We can push things away from our body or pull them towards our body. That's a bench press or a row. We can squat down and we can pick things up. That's a squat and a deadlift. We can hinge at our hips. And so we take these foundational movements that are just so primal. It's the stuff that our bodies are naturally designed to do. And we do those with resistance. And we do those in a circuit fashion where you're getting the strength and the cardio and the mobility all on one. So what a workout might look like is getting a pair of dumbbells or kettlebells. It might take 20 to 40 minutes, depending on how big you want to get. And we might do a flow of movements, like start off with some swings to activate the glutes and the hips, immediately into some squats, into some shoulder presses, into some rows, into some push-ups, swing, squat, press, pull, row, something like that. And we can do these in a circuit fashion. So for people who are busy, high intensity exercise pulsed, even like two, three times a week, 20, 30 minutes spaced out, gives you a massive benefit for days afterwards. And strength training really is like the fountain of youth. And it's so, so good because it activates all these longevity genes. As we begin to build new muscle, we have a higher metabolic rate, which means we can eat more food while maintaining a good weight, which is like a huge benefit to maintaining muscle mass. When we strength train as well, it changes how our bodies process carbohydrates and it makes us more insulin sensitive. So eating, uh, eating a, well, not say you should, but eating a pizza after a workout is a different experience for your body than eating a pizza when you haven't done training. Training makes our muscles like sponges for carbohydrates and it makes us more insulin sensitive. So we process carbohydrates better. And that effect can be persistent for like many hours after a workout, maybe even 12 hours, you get better nutrition, uh, nutrient partitioning. So I love thinking about exercise for busy people, particularly over 40 as pulsed. It's something you do a couple times per week pulsed. You set it in your schedule as a meeting. And if you're very short on time, then you do these combination MRT workouts that involve joint friendly motions in a circuit fashion. And we have a YouTube channel that has literally like dozens, if not hundreds of these types of workouts that people can check out. Um, But I think the way to think about it is intense exercise is sprinkled in. What is very, very, very important for longevity is getting daily activity. And this is something that you can accumulate just through general motion, getting more steps in throughout the day, taking little breaks from sitting down and getting up and stretching your spine, doing some squats, hanging from a pull-up bar. I hang one in my office to really lengthen my spine a few times per day, increase blood flow like this 
taking a walk, get, taking the stairs, like all this stuff massively adds up. Um, so I think daily activity is probably more important than formal exercise, but the high intensity exercise is great. Now, if you're at a point where you have good fitness and you're looking at like pushing your muscle building gains, then maybe doing more traditional strength training where you have more rest in between sets is the good path to do that. And what I find interesting is as we get older, one of the things that goes down is our recovery capacity. We just don't recover as quickly from exercise. So you actually, the benefit of that is you actually need less exercise. You just need to be a little smarter about your training. So maybe like if you're looking at building muscle, a couple of different splits that work well for guys over 40 is even two to three times per week of full body strength training. Whereas like if you used to do like a chest day or something like that, and you did 20 sets of chest, you divide those 20 sets across three workouts where you're doing less total volume in any given workout, but you're getting more pulses. So you're like getting more effective volume and not as much of this junk volume destroying your chest. So you're so sore for like seven days and you can't train again. So higher frequency, lower volume in any given workout tends to work better for people as they get older. And then also building your entire training plan around joint friendly motions. So this is unique to each of us. We all have different biomechanics. We all have different injuries uh, and, and exercises that just feel good for us. You got to find what works for you and what feels good and then learn to work around that and have some grace because you're not going to have the same knees you had when you were 20, when you're 50, even if you didn't have an injury, like it's just a fact that the, the cartilage just gets a little more, uh, down. So you need to have like low impact activities. Maybe you start to bike and swim a little bit more for your cardio. You know, maybe you start to do certain kinds of motions to build up your knees and, and you're not jumping as much and doing other dynamic stuff. It's not that things are off limits, but I think your baseline stuff needs to be super, super joint friendly. And there's some small tweaks you can make that make things so much better. So as opposed to just a regular bench press, even bench pressing with dumbbells makes it a lot easier because the bar path is not as fixed and you can move your shoulders in a good way. If you put that bench on a slight 10 to 15 degree decline, it opens the shoulder girdle up and doesn't have as much impingement. So just these little nuances to a training plan can make it so that you feel good when you lift. If you're someone that's having pain after you lift, like eventually that's going to catch up to you. And when you get sidelined with a tendon injury or something like that for a couple of weeks, it can be really unmotivating. So like the lens is always what feels good on your body. The lens is always, you know, less frequency, but like, you know, I guess there's usually like not as much volume in any given session, spreading it out throughout the week yeah. and understanding that a couple big lifting or high intensity workouts, two, three times a week is plenty to get a great benefit because the body composition is driven largely by nutrition. You cannot out-exercise a bad diet. So you pair like a good eating plan 80% of the way with a couple sprinkled in training to help you feel good, not overtraining because we're trying to maintain a healthy nervous system. You're, you're on track. And then you're going to learn. Your goals are going to change. That training plan that was really fun for eight weeks is going to get boring in time. So even like cultivating the kind of mindset that we're always like trying new things and flowing between different programs, this is a lifelong journey. You don't win fitness. It's not like you win and it's over. It's just like, no, you wake up the next day and you keep on staying on this. So I think there's benefit to coming in with people's structured programs, whether it's Fit Father or something like that, but just hopping on something that you can try for a period of time, you're going to learn a lot You'll be exposed to new ways of doing things. And that's just another tool in your tool belt. And you're going to continuously have to cycle through different things based on the demands of your life and your ever and changing goals. So, I mean, I guess that's a, that's a big picture of how we approach exercise, metabolic resistance training, classic strength training is, is very good with joint friendly exercises. If you're at your goal weight, I'll say this one more time. If someone has like fat to lose, if you look in your midsection, you're like, I'd prefer there to be less here then that is the first place you focus on. You lose the fat first before focusing on like a big muscle building plan because as you get leaner, it actually becomes easier to build muscle. You're more insulin sensitive and, and you're just building from a better base. Gotcha. I love that. I love what you said about joint friendly too because I don't do much stuff like plyometrics anymore. It's just, it's just yeah. too, too tough on the knees. Um, and I like little things like, yeah, I never do a flat bench press either. I'm always doing like these. Just yes. little things like that I really, really, like, really appreciate so we, we talked a little bit before we started the recording about stem cells. So I know a lot of people are going to, I think it's called uh, Cellular Performance Institute in Tijuana. I went to Bioaccelerator in Colombia. I got some stem cells a few months ago and you said you you got some stem cells too. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know that's how like the, the in vogue thing I've had when, when I went down to Colombia, I had so many messages from people. Can you talk a little bit about it? And I was like, well, g give me a few months because you know they said it can take three to, nine, to 12 months to really feel the effects. Um, and I had, I had my... My, I have some um, D 
degenerative discs, discs in my lumbar yeah. and my neck. So I got my neck, my lumbar, and then both yeah. my elbows, both my knees. So I did, and I got an IV. So I did a lot of stem cells. Um, and I had better results, I think, on my knees than with my back and neck. But I know that I'm trying to give it time and just be patient. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to know kind of your experience and your thoughts on, on stem cells. Sure. I'll say like, I'm, I'm far from a stem cell expert, but I, I will have some valuable things to share. And I do have some direct experience. There's many different places that you can harvest stem cells from. Mm-hmm. You can get them from your own body through bone marrow or from fat. And there's different types of stem cells. When we say stem cells, it's not like it's just like one cell line. There's different kinds of cell lines that can turn into different kinds of tissue. Many people who go to out of country places uh, like the Tijuana clinics have embryonic stem cells. So they're getting these from, uh, from honestly, like his umbilical cords typically of, of aborted babies and stuff like this. But these are like not your own native stem cells, but they do have the ability to turn into a whole bunch of different things. And the body has its ability to heal itself. And stem cells are these cells that have the ability to turn into all different kinds of things when they meet the right kind of environment. And they also trigger a lot of downstream growth factors. So when you inject stem cells, stem cells are recruiting other tissues to help heal those ligament injuries or strengthen up the discs in your back. And when you IV them as well, like you said, you're getting an infusion of these stem cells. They're going throughout your heart. They're going into the circulation system, which that blood is reaching everywhere. And they have a benefit for basically like turning back the clock, reducing DNA damage, increasing the telomeres. So there's many places you can get them. The kind of stem cells that I got are a unique kind called VSELs. They're called very small embryonic-like stem cells, and they're actually harvested from your own blood. They can get them from the blood, this particular clinic in California called Kigenix, Q-I-G-E-N-I-X. They'll hit them with a particular kind of laser. It's a red laser, and then they explode in population, and then they'll inject those into your knees, or I got some IV as well, as well as into my leg and my knee. Um, and and it's regenerative therapy. It it helps. I, I don't think these are things that are necessarily like a complete cure all, um, but very powerful for awakening some of the healing processes, and particularly for those uh, long nagging joint issues. It can be very helpful. And I'd say stem cells are also in the line of other regenerative therapies. People might be able to experience closer to home, like platelet-rich plasma injections (PRP), which is taking your blood and injecting that into old tendon and joint injuries. It's like it's like stem cells. Stem cells are just like the bigger click of this. And now, how do you actually like maximize stem cells if you ever do want to have these therapies? It's actually doing some fasting. Fasting, as I said, can really activate the body's own stem cells. So heading into a stem cell therapy and doing some fasting heading into that can really help awaken some of these stem cells as well as you know afterwards having really good nutrition. Things that crush stem cells are having high blood sugars all the time. So if you want to really make sure that your immune system is suppressed, to make sure you're constantly eating crap inflammatory foods with lots of sugar. So after you get one of these stem cell treatments, it's another reason to really be good on your nutrition and be gentle on your body. Um, and yeah, I mean, like we can, there, it's, it's a frontier of, of, of medicine right now where we can use these different stem cells to regenerate. And I think I had a pretty similar experience to you where they've been helpful, but I think people should realize that it's not like you take these and everything all you wake up and you're like, I feel like I'm 10 again. It's not quite like that, but I think they can move the needle on some old connective tissue issues. Um, and I think it's something that I will repeat on a regular basis. I'm getting another therapy, uh, actually next week. I'm actually overseeing a stem cell clinic in Sedona, Arizona, where the doctors who know what they're doing are um, the medical director of this cool clinic. So I'm excited about that. And they're going to give me a treatment as well. Um, yeah, I'd say good benefit. Um, there's probably things I'd try before stem cells first. Um, I would make sure if there's any areas of this lifestyle optimization that someone has, I would do that. If there's an area of your body that hurts knees or elbows, I would do an aggressive physical therapy. Like, I don't know if you've been on YouTube and heard some of like the knees over toes guy. It's Ben, Ben yes. Patrick, I think is his name. You know, like all those exercises for strengthening the muscles around the knees and creating strength through an entire range of motion may do more for someone's knees than just like a single stem cell injection. So like these issues to pain are like multifactorial. You can use cells to grow things, but it's, it's a holistic picture. I think it's a tool among many. I'm so glad you said that because I had an MCL tear in a jiu-jitsu competition a year ago yeah. and I did um, Ben Patrick's program and I, I I got it better through that. Um, well, I got the stem cells in my knees more as a preventive. They were actually yeah. probably the least thing troubling me. Um, but but what even just what you said is so many people, they, they want to take a pill or have a procedure because it's easy, right? You just go there and you have it done as opposed to getting a program like Ben Patrick's program and doing yeah. it you know, three times a week for the rest of your life. So it's like, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that, that there, there is no easy fixes like this, that there's nothing better to focus our energy on than, than looking after ourselves. And I was 
I always tell people and I always think it, I think I'm going to get more and more into longevity. Like when I started yeah. this podcast, I wasn't really thinking longevity and parenting, but they're two topics that I'm very fond of just because I'm a new dad and I'm thinking about my longevity now I'm older. Um, so brother, I don't want to take up, take up your whole afternoon. I really appreciate your time. Um, and so you've been such a wealth of knowledge. You've been, you've been incredible. I, I, I had high expectations and you, um, you, you surpass them. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts? And I'll put links to your YouTube channel. I'll put links to, um, you know, your, your website, but if you have any final thoughts before we wrap it up, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, yeah, I, the capstone thought will be this. I think the food you put in your mouth every single day is going to be one of the greatest determinants of your longevity long-term. And every, every meal that you eat can either be the kind of meal that helps give your body more energy, reduces inflammation, gives you nutrients for healing, or it can be the kind of meal that creates inflammation, damage, and you're going to have to pay for down the line. And so for those of us that want to live a long, healthy life, that want to have energy and clarity, like put more weight onto your nutrition, continue to learn self-experiment, take it more seriously, try different diets, get direct knowledge and experience. It is probably one of the biggest areas uh, that we can all invest in. And then the second thing I would share with that, the other pair is as best as you can take time out of your busy day to work on your mental, emotional, and spiritual practices. Like even having those little bits of moments, ideally the morning and the night where you can learn to retrain your mind, to see through eyes that have more gratitude, to get more clarity on things that need to be cut out of your life. That is also going to be the basis of your entire experience. When you can learn to have a more peaceful, present, connected, and strong, focused mind, you're going to be able to approach all these challenges much better. Those are the two leverage points, the mental self-reflection and self-knowledge, and then the feeding your body with the right kinds of foods. Everything else that we talked about is beneficial, but secondary to those two things. Anthony, that's absolutely beautiful. You're a true gentleman and a scholar, and I really appreciate you. And I'm I'm looking forward to playing back this conversation because there were so many things you said where I wanted to pause and think about it, write it down. So I really, really appreciate your time and, and you sharing the knowledge. And I'll put links to everything in the show notes, but I just really appreciate you, Anthony. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lawrence.